All right. So um, it is the evening for me. It is time to see if you can figure out how many times I can yawn throughout the rest of this lesson. All right. So we talked a little bit going back about the big picture, the big process of photosynthesis. There are two major parts, the light reactions and the Calvin cycle. One uses light directly to make ATP and NADPH. And the other, the Calvin cycle, uses the things made in the light reactions to reduce carbon dioxide to a higher energy carbon molecule called G3P, which can then be made into many other things. Again, the important thing to do here is to try and understand the context of photosynthesis, keeping in mind how photosynthesis is directly related to and dependent upon in many ways the process of cellular respiration because cellular respiration produces carbon dioxide and water whereas photosynthesis uses carbon dioxide and water and one's waste products are another's reactants and the other's reactants are the other's waste products. So keep in mind, keep that in mind. It'll be a major theme uh, throughout photosynthesis, the similarities and differences between the two. Um, we can't really talk about the process of photosynthesis without talking about electromagnetic energy or the energy that is needed to drive these all important reactions. Right? There are so many, so many different types of energy. If you can define um, energy in the form of waves or particles or waves or particles you can define it as as long wavelength and very short wavelength energy um, electromagnetic energy is the is the energy that is going to be primarily used in photosynthesis and yes there are many different types of energy um, but electromagnetic energy uh, is basically energy that can be a particle or not. Um, generally is not a particle, but moves in a wave-like fashion. So the first thing to understand is that sh uh, energy that moves in shorter wavelengths has higher energy, has a higher energy state. Um, if you could imagine these molecules over here are moving very fast in, the, in their waves, and the waves tend to... Uh, the peaks as you, and the troughs tend to happen closer to one another than these longer wavelengths, which are actually a lower energy wavelength. So when we're talking about energy and how it moves, all right, what we're really talking about is the wavelength is being dictated by how much energy the particles or um, waves like a motion have. So speaking of specific part of electromagnetic energy, the visible light spectrum is the part basically from 350 nanometers to 800 to 720 nanometers uh, in wavelength. All right? And if you remember the the rainbow is Roy G. Biv, all right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, all right? If you were to go further in this direction, higher energy from violet, you would have ultraviolet, UV, all right? And if you were to go even further on this side, lower energy from, from red, you would have something called infrared, all right? Now, a lot of the energy that humans, or mammals for that matter, release as heat is being released in the form of infrared energy. So it's not energy that's released in the form of light, it's energy that's released in the form of heat, all right? Um, and heat can be measured um, or described as infrared in many ways, all right? Um, UV is, uh, is a type of um, energy that is emitted by the sun that is very high energy molecules or high energy radiation that basically has the ability to do damage to certain cells. 
But the, the wavelengths that are important to us, especially for photosynthesis, are the visible light spectrum. All right, and we'll talk a little bit more about how the visible light spectrum uh, is important. So if you, to measure the amount of energy that occurs in this electromagnetic energy that moves in waves, we need to measure two things. All right? One is the amplitude, means the height of the peak from the middle of the wavelength. And the other thing we want to measure is the, the, the distance between two peaks or two troughs. All right? The distance between two peaks or two troughs is called wavelength. All right? The more energy that uh, molecules have or things that are moving have, the closer their peaks will be to one another. All right? As you can see, this person here was maybe sitting in the sun for a little too long and the electromagnetic energy had the ability to damage the actual skin cells um, and inflame them, turning them red. So sunburn is really just skin damage at the result of high energy radiation or ultraviolet rays. Now what a prism does is separate white light, which is the basically light that you cannot see but it receives is received by the earth separates that light into its different energy levels and the energy levels differ based on the wavelengths of the different types of light so what a prism does is it passes white light through a prism all right by which the wavelengths or energy levels of the colors separate and this is one of the the well, this is one of the first major experiments to distinctly show that white light is in fact uh, a combination of many different w energy electromagnetic energy wavelength type things so one of the coolest things about biology to me is is this field of biology called sensory ecology and in other words uh, Others call it perceptual worlds, is what do other organisms see? Do other organisms see the world as we see it? Or is the world to other organisms completely different based on their senses? Now we know that dogs um, have a better sense of smell than humans do. We know that humans rely mostly on their eyesight and have a, very, a fairly weak sense of smell. We know that owls have a good eyesight, but even better hearing. And we know that insects can see many different types of light that humans cannot see. They can see things like infrared, or they can see, the, they can see more detail when it comes to light, or what is being reflected off of other things. So one of the coolest things about this field of biology is if the senses that organisms are using vary in their intensity, then doesn't their entire world become different? If what you are experiencing is based on your most dominant sense, then all the, the world is entirely different for every type of organism. We all know that the world is different for different humans, and we all see the world in generally the same way as far as the actual things that we're picking up from our surroundings. But imagine one person who smells the world and another person who sees the world and another person who hears the world and yet another person that tastes the world. And imagine how different these worlds would be. Imagine how much different the smell of uh, pizza in the car would be to a person that has their sense of smell as their primary mode of perceiving the world versus somebody who sees things and hears and smells very poorly isn't going to have the same response. It's another reason why hum uh, dogs and animals are so attracted, especially like things like bears and predators, are so attracted to trash because we think trash as smelly, um, wasted food material that is inedible but these other organisms sense it as something completely different. They sense a sweetness or a fattiness or a saltiness on a whole different level than humans would. 
So this world is really awesome. And it kind of just shows us a little bit about how important different types of light are. Just because we can see one type of light doesn't mean that all organisms can see that same thing. All right. What we're looking at here is the vision of a human on top versus the vision of another animal, this animal here. And up here we have another vision of a human in this kind of courtyard alley. And then the same animal, uh, as a, the same animal sees this. All right. And researchers have figured out what other organisms, other organisms can see based on the composition of chemicals in their eyes as compared to what humans have. So humans have a certain composition of chemicals that are designed to pig their pigments that are designed to take in light. All right. And uh, scientists can look at the different chemical pigments in different eyes and see what the organism is designed to see. So can anyone guess what this, the second and fourth picture are both the same animal. The first and the third are definitely humans. Um, can you guess what organism sees in this way? And if you can also uh, try to figure out any differences that you see between these two and then try to figure it out. Now up top here, we're looking at, uh, on the, this left-hand picture, this is an organism that sees infrared, meaning an organism that does not see light, but organism sees the heat or entropy that is released in the form of infrared, meaning um, energy that cannot be seen, but uh, energy that is basically seen by its temperature. Let's try to figure out what organism this is. Let's try to figure out what organism this is. This organism sees a much more distinctly versatile range of colors than humans do. So very simple colors and shapes might look a lot more diverse to an organism like this. And also uh, over here we're looking at an organism that sees basically two pictures. And over here an organism, uh, this is at night, so an organism that's basically seeing um, in night vision. All right, so you can figure out what type of organisms those are. Um, we can talk about them in class. But there are just ways that organisms see differently. It's really awesome because plants see differently too. All right. Plants are going to be absorbing this light, but they're not they're going to be different depending on where on earth they live, what exactly they're designed to do, how much energy they need, their evolutionary their their evolutionary lineage. All these things are going to differ in different plants, but there are some main things that that tie plants together. All right. So all the things that were we just looked at is really about perceptual worlds and how organisms perceive the world and plants do the same thing. They perceive a world differently from we do. They perceive the world as light. So light is a particle that moves in waves. The photon, which is a particle of light, is one of the first objects with mass to be defined both as a wave and, and as a particle, all right? Much of the time, electromagnetic energy or energy moves in waves. For example, an ocean without any wind has no waves. But when it's windy, the energy of the passing air over the water can actually be transferred into moving through the water and causing the the wave-like motion. So what wa all waves are are the transference of wind energy to energy in water. Okay, so and we know that waves, wave-like energy, has the ability to bend around objects, all right, and also can be dissipated once it reaches a point where it has to change form. All right. On the other hand, particles, all right act somewhat differently from waves, although photons, packets of light, can act both as waves and particles. So there are many experiments that can show that, that packets of light, photons, can move both as waves and particles, one of them being called the Young's double slit experiment, and I looked that one up. That one can show you 
the experiment that really led to the idea that, that the photon, which is a particle of light and electromagnetic energy, can move both as a wave and a particle. All right, so we, we got our background in electromagnetic energy. We're going to be focusing mostly on the visible light part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Although I will, we will be mentioning uh, higher energy waves like gamma and x-rays, ultraviolet rays, and lower energy waves called like radio waves and infrared waves. But just an importance of the understanding of uh, why or how wave-like energy is important, um, how high and low energy things move in waves, and most importantly, what, like how, where visible light or white light is on this spectrum and how it's important to plants. All right. So if we want to talk more about the plant cell, we can get more into the nitty gritty that we're going to be focusing on the organelle where photosynthesis occurs called the chloroplast. All right. The chloroplast has many parts. Let's see. No, it's the next one. The chloroplast has an inner and outer membrane. Inside the, inside the chloroplast, it has a cytoplasm-like substance called the stroma that is specific to the chloroplast. It has these stacks in it called thylakoids. Let's move back here. All right. So each one of these stacks here is called the thylakoid, and a stack of thylakoids is called granum, and many stacks are called grana. All right. Now the thylakoids themselves have a cytosol in them called the thylakoid space, which is very similar or very alike the mitochondrial matrix. So then start making those comparisons between photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Both photosynthesis and parts of cellular respiration occur in double membrane organelles all right, that, uh, where energy is created. So if we move further along here, talk about the plant cell. We, we really know all about the, the organelles in the plant cell. Uh, the mitochondria is where cellular respiration occurs. And please don't forget that cellular respiration still occurs in plant cells, all right? So plants, although they make their own energy in the form of sugar and ATP, can also, if they need to, break that energy down, so they would need mitochondria too. If plant cells only had chloroplasts, no mitochondria, they would only be able to make things. They wouldn't be able to make, break things down. So mitochondria are still important to the plant cell, all right? Again, let's do an overview of photosynthesis, all right? Photosynthesis has two major pieces, the light reactions, all right, which include an electron transport chain of proteins, and the Calvin cycle, which we call the light independent reactions. So the light reactions or the light dependent reactions, because they need the existence of a direct light source in order to occur, and then we have the light independent reactions called the Calvin cycle, all right. Both of these are going to occur in the chloroplast organelle, all right, one of them is going to occur in the stroma, the Calvin cycle occurs in the stroma, sorry, and the light reactions occur on the thylakoid membrane. So they're going to be happening um, on the thylakoid membrane, in the thylakoid space, and partially in the stroma as well. Okay, here we go again on photosynthesis. We talked about the major parts of photosynthesis, the synthesis, the making of organic material in the form of sugars from light energy, which is this process of photosynthesis. The reactants to photosynthesis are water, carbon dioxide, and light energy. And the products of photosynthesis are oxygen and sugar in some form. Okay. So if we move right or wrong, if we move right or wrong, uh, we have all this light energy, right? The sun is constantly emitting and emitting, emitting energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation, some of it in the form of light, some of it in the form of infrared, some of it in the form of ultraviolet, some in the form of gamma rays and x-rays and all these different forms of light energy. But plants are only going to be using a specific portion of that. They're going to be using what we call visible light. All right. Now pigments are chemicals or molecules that are specifically designed to absorb specific electromagnetic energy with specific wavelengths. All right. 
two of the main pigments in plants, and they occur in the chloroplast organelles, are chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. All right? One of the most important things about these two molecules is they don't really differ that much from one another. All right? Actually, you'd be hard pressed to find the difference between these two molecules. All right? If you can find the difference between these two molecules, you'll see that the difference is very slight. I'm actually not going to tell you the difference between these two molecules. I want you to kind of figure out on your own. But there are differences between chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. All right? So these two molecules, very similar, absorb very, very different wavelengths of light. All right? So the two most common pigments in plants are chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. Now plants all have these things called accessory pigments, um, which are designed to enhance the absorptive ability of leaves on the plants. Um, and they also have things like antioxidant effect. Um, they have antibacterial effects. They have anti-cancerous, antimicrobial effects as well. So generally, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B are the two most common pigments in plants that are designed to absorb light energy. But also these things called carotenoids, which carrots have a lot of. All right, you can imagine that they kind of they give off a yellowish orange color. And physoerythrin is another plant pigment that is also designed uh, to have an antioxidant and absorptive effect. So some of these pigments <clears throat> act as vitamins or nutrients for the plant and other organisms. And other pigments can act more as absorptive mechanism than others. So it's important to notice that plants have more than two pigments, although these are the two most common pigments in, in most plants. All right. So pigments absorb light energy. All right. Now we're looking here at the absorption spectrum of plants. All right. And what you're seeing here is the visible light spectrum here from 350 to about 720 nanometers, which is wavelengths of light. So we're looking at lower energy wavelengths here and no sorry higher energy wavelengths over here with with lower this is the uh, this is the distance between two peaks or two troughs or wavelength and over here we have red and uh, far over here would be infrared which basically is much lower in electromagnetic energy than all of the other colors so if we want to focus on one let's focus on chlorophyll a here in the in this aqua color Chlorophyll A basically absorbs the most light energy that comes in around 430 nanometers, 425 nanometers maybe, all right? And then it drops, meaning it has no absorptive capability of any wavelengths of light, basically between 460 and very low, very low, very low, and then absorbs more light energy again around 680 nanometers. All right. If we look at chlorophyll B, all right, we have this green portion here. Chlorophyll B absorbs light at around 450 nanometers maximum, has a very steep drop in the amount of light energy it can absorb, and then has a smaller peak around 660 nanometers, all right, and a smaller peak here. All right. Notice that both chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B have not one, but two peaks to them. Now another important thing to understand is that other accessory pigments like carotenoids and phycoerythrin and another one called uh, phycocyanin are pigments that also have different absorptive abilities. Now the carotenoids mostly absorb between 420 and 480 nanometers and phycoerythrin absorbs lots of white light energy that is not absorbed at all by chlorophyll A or chlorophyll B or the carotenoids. And if you look at phycocyanin, phycocyanin has a peak of its absorption around 600 nanometers, which allows the absorption spectrum of all these pigments and accessory pigments, the ability for plants to absorb as much light as possible.